If you're an author or plan to be one, get excited because this podcast is for you. Book Marketing Mentors is the only podcast dedicated to helping you successfully market and sell your book. If you're ready for empowering conversations with successful marketing mavens, then grab a coffee or tea and listen in to your host, international best-selling author, Susan Friedman. Welcome to Book Marketing Mentors, the weekly podcast where you learn proven strategies, tools, ideas, and tips from the masters. Every week, I introduce you to a marketing master who will share their expertise to help you market and sell more books. Today, my special guest is Hirsch Rapun. With jewel chops in comedy and advertising, Hirsch has enjoyed an eclectic career spanning two decades as a messaging expert and as a stand-up comedian playing gigs across the country. He hosts the popular Yes Brand podcast, helping founders and CEOs tackle messaging challenges with humor and humanity. His clients include change makers, market leaders, agencies, institutions, production companies, and Oscar-winning filmmakers. As a brand storyteller, Hirsch operates on one simple principle, sell the truth. And Hirsch, it's truly a pleasure to welcome you to the show and thank you for being this week's guest expert and mentor. It's such a pleasure to be here, Susan. Thank you for having me. So sell the truth. Let's dig into that. I know that's the subject that's near and dear to your heart, but let's first of all as you know, I want to get very granular and make sure that we're all on the same page. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, selling the truth really popped into my head. And I don't know how long ago, but I do know that having worked in public relations and copywriting and doing almost every form of communication in the written form and on stage and all that, the through line to me was always that things worked best, things landed best or resonated best when they were honest, because there's a certain confidence and a certain conviction that comes through with honesty. At the same time, I recognize that the truth is not always palatable. And so the tendency might be to move away from it, not only that people sometimes tell a complete untruth, but that they might just simply avoid it. They might simply avoid the truth. And so it is a very layered subject for me in that it it's not a moral statement. You know, honesty is the best policy because you shouldn't hurt people. And those things are things we understand and hopefully espouse, but it's not a judgment or a lifestyle direction. It's strictly a branding and marketing point of view that we have to embrace the truth and accept it first, and then we're able to sell it to the audience. We're touching on something very touchy here, and that is that there is so much fake news out there. How do we even tell fact from fiction? That is a very, very great point and a very difficult thing that we're going through these past several years. I cover it a lot in my book, Selling the Truth, which is coming out very soon, if it's not out already. But one of the things that I deal with is that we have to create a new baseline for reality. And because things can be manipulated, because we are manipulated by whatever media we choose to follow is going to kind of be a little bit off, we should really get back to the basics of what's true to us. You know, if you stub your toe and it hurts, you know that's true. Nobody can tell you you didn't stub your toe or it doesn't hurt. And I think if we start to focus on those very small, tiny incremental little truths, then we can possibly rebuild our relationship with fact rather than get up there and say, well, that's not true. It's so clear. He did this or she did this. They stole this or they did this or they went here and they went there. And then it all becomes about world events and about politics and about social commentary and liberalism versus conservatism. And it's it's so silly to reach so high when we're trying to verify life on Earth. Let's start with a very, very small personal truths that, again, 
we don't hide from ourselves. And if we could just start to be a little more honest with ourselves, a little more granular to use your term about what is actually true, we don't have to tell anybody. We can keep these little truths to ourselves and just start collecting information. We might get better at it. And then there's the aspect of the little white lie or just sort of (laughs) fabricating the truth a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) There's a grayness here. (laughs) Yes, Susan. I mean, that's something that I always had a little struggle with as a kid because it seemed to me that there are positions that you'll be put in where someone doesn't want to hear the truth or it's going to hurt their feelings and what is the value. But if you lie, then you're doing something wrong. What I believe is that intent plays a large part in it. There's no easy answer to whether white lies, as we call them, are good or bad. But like I say, we're not really judging it. But what you can do is you can look down the line at the trajectory of your lie. Like a mentor of mine once said, you have to be careful or you create a tissue of lies. I didn't really understand exactly what that meant or where he got that from, but it seemed to be like the idea of you're tying, you know, like you look at a magician's uh, handkerchief string and you one lie begets another lie begets another lie. And so I think if you look down the road from your little white lie, you may be dissuaded because you may go, oh, well, this could actually not work out so well and this could backfire as it often does, right? How does it often backfire? We tell a little white lie and it turns into a bigger, we're wrong anyway. So I think looking down the road is not a bad strategy. Well, and I think something with regard to that is also the fact that do we always remember the little white lie that we told that the other person might remember and we may forget and say something else and they're like, okay, didn't you say something different the last time? And as you age, who remembers? You know, like I'll remember certain things, but I may not remember what we talked about before the interview began. And so you could very well catch me in in a lie there. So you're right. I believe it was a Mark Twain quote of some kind that it's less to remember, right? Telling the truth makes it easier than having to remember everything else. So that's a really good um, inspiration to be forthright, especially when dealing with consumers and an audience, you know, whether they're uh, uh, your book reading audience or they're your your audience of consumers or they're your fans. You said a word earlier that my ears pricked up, and that's the word perspective, because we all have a perspective about certain things. And our perspective is our truth. Now, if you have a different perspective of something, that's your truth. And I have mine. That's my truth. What's the reality there? What's factual? (laughs) What's factual if our perceptions, well, we're entitled to our individual perceptions. And yet we get into trouble. I'm perceiving a truth. It really becomes an opinion. I go back to what I said about the small granular little truths that are irrefutable because the bigger things, if we accept that they're a matter of opinion, We can't convince the other person. And why do we need to? You say, who's right? Why do we really need to know who's right? What does it change? And I believe that a lot of people deep down, and this goes back to that theory of if we just start really small, we can rebuild our relationship with the truth. But I think a lot of people know what the truth is and that the argument is a lot of just bluster. So there's not really a benefit in saying the irrefutable evidence points to this because people will these days see irrefutable evidence and refute it, right? I give them more credit. I think that people who are exposed to a certain truth may simply just choose not to accept it, in which case there's no antidote for that. Yeah. And that leads me into the idea of handling criticism from readers or if we're on stage, if we're speaking, who might disagree with our perspective on a controversial topic. How do we handle that? What's the easy way that we don't sort of get into what we've just saying, you know, you believe this and I believe that and hey. Yeah. 
a friend of mine, uh, Justo Diaz, also a writer, said that humor is the great equalizer. When we perform comedy, we can neutralize the tension because we're distilling the stress and the strain with humor. That often comes in the form of not taking ourselves too seriously. We're not making light of another person's opinion. We're not mocking. It's not mockery. But I think perspective, go back to that word, it comes through when we distill the tension and the opinions with some humor. It's like you have the correspondence dinner in Washington, and they traditionally poke fun, the media pokes fun at the president, the president pokes fun at the media, and there's a kind of a a laugh over some of the scrutiny that they both face in their respective jobs. And I think that stuff is good. It's good to lighten things up. That's the best tool I can think of. So humor, obviously, is something that we know you're very interested in and you perform. So how far is too far when you inject humor into a brand message? Yeah. Well, Susan, so there's a chapter in the book called comedy in advertising, how far is too soon, which is a play on the phrase that people will shout it in a comedy club sometimes if someone makes a joke that's really a sensitive topic and people will go too soon, too soon. And how far can you go with comedy and when is it too much? So when it comes to that, I believe that intent is paramount. If you look at somebody like Don Rickles, who was, you know, what they would call an insult comedian, although he you know, and I've said this before, he really had such incredible likability and warmth as a human being that the persona wasn't taken to be threatening or serious. He diffused the tension by calling attention to everybody's warts and, you know, to the elephant in the room and anything that might be a target for lampooning, he would lampoon it so that he could control the narrative and there wouldn't be an opportunity for offense. It was brilliant, and I, I don't even know that I've ever seen anyone do it so well. But that's, you know, a gift that he had. One of the things that you're very good at, and I know we've had your good friend Izzy Gazelle here talking about improv. So yeah. the practicing improv, I mean, that was one of the best classes that I ever took was an improv class because just allowing myself to say something in the spur of the moment without having to think too much about it, I mean, makes a difference. Yeah. It's funny because when I started doing improv, I wanted to perform at such a high level that I put a lot of pressure on myself to follow the rules of improv and it distracted me until I was able to let go and fall into that moment. And Izzy, as you know, uses improv to improve life skills. And there's so much that can be gleaned from extemporaneous conversation. That is what Izzy's doing in a way, is that you're having a conversation that doesn't have boundaries because it isn't held to a particular framework a particular standard. Anything can happen because we know we're kind of on a tightrope. And that's how we feel in life often, is we're on some kind of tightrope. And I think the more we practice kidding around and the less precious we make our own feelings around it, the better we'll get along with people. I love the idea of using humor to diffuse what could be, you know, as a get into an argument about a controversial topic, that having some one-liners to diffuse that, but that's something that you would have like in your toolbox. This is something that you could practice or just know a few lines that might diffuse, you know, a controversial situation. Is that something you would recommend? What I think works best is when people are leaning into their true personality. And I think that if if we try to do something that isn't us and doesn't suit us, that rings hollow and awkward and it doesn't really help. So we have to really explore it and find out, well, what is our sense of humor? What kind of sense of humor do we have? There probably is a test out there 
to figure out what kind of sense of humor you have. But is it dry? Is it outrageous? Is it goofy? Is it punny? You know, do you like to play with language? And figure out what your sense of humor is like. But honestly, heart is so much more important and conditioning our sensitivity for others and the fact that others are entitled to their opinion, their wild, crazy opinion, whatever it is, they're entitled to the opinion. I probably could have saved this time. I could have said this at the outset of this uh, diatribe that I went, but that's improv. That's what happens when you're improvising. I think that if the intent in the beginning is to make yourself the foil so that you're not making the other person the whipping post, you're not having fun at their expense, you're just doing it at your expense in the slightest way. It's a form of humility and it's a gesture. So we don't have to think of it so much as funny as humility being a a kind of a polite gesture that lets the other person know that we don't think we're better than they are. Yeah, I found that for me, humor was something that I never thought that I had a sense of humor. I was always so (laughs) serious about stuff. Well, I grew up in a family that was very serious about stuff. So, you know, it's hard. And I met my husband and he's complete opposite. And he's got a very dry sense of humor, which takes a while sometimes for people to get. You know, they don't think they're like, is he serious when he says that? You know, they often say to me, so I love the idea of poking fun at ourselves. Mm -hmm. I've demonstrated it when I'm on the stage or even on the recordings is that, as you say, it's a humility, it's a humanity, it's a authenticity. It's me. I mean, you know, I'm poking fun at me rather than as you say, making the other person the whipping post. Uh, right. So, yeah, I love that idea. And I know that it works very well. And I think in comedy, generally, that's always something that works well. There are comics that develop a persona that is a more of an acting persona, and that's acting. And sometimes what happens when that happens is that the acting persona is not following the rules of human engagement where you have to be nice. You know, Andy Kaufman was a perfect example of this with one of his stage characters and his own persona. That just being offensive and being truly not considerate or nice took it to a place where people didn't find it funny or people had to struggle to find it funny. I think that there's a a way to get around that with our humor and that's to turn the silliness on ourselves in an obvious way. He could have thought Andrew Dice Clay, who had the, you know this Dice Man character, and he couldn't separate it from himself when he was at one time the biggest comic on the scene. But he couldn't separate this character that he kind of saw as a goofball that he was kind of making fun of, but it was so appealing to the audience that he couldn't decide whether he wanted to be that person or not. And it became a career stumbling block. Turning all of this back to this whole subject of selling the truth, and I feel that there's components of that in what we've been saying, but yes, how does humor play into this whole idea of selling the truth? For this, we have to point briefly to my other podcast, which is called Truth Tastes Funny, which really is not about business and not about the consumer and not about branding. It's simply a survival guide for the times we live in. And the premise is that what makes reality digestible is the humor that we bring to absurd situations. We look at a a pandemic or we look at any kind of natural disaster, man-made disaster, the cruelty we see in the world, and we call on a reserve that allows it to mix with uh, perspective with some sense of absurdity and irony and even em- embrace of helplessness. And in there, we survive through comedy because that's what I did it during the pandemic. I made silly little videos of me and my family because I couldn't be around anyone else. We couldn't even go outside very much for a while. I called on all these characters that I used to do and made little videos because I thought that that's the only way to keep my sanity. So I think the same holds true that without reality, there is no comedy. 
And without comedy, reality is too hard to digest. Oh, that's very interesting. I hadn't even thought about that perspective, but yes. I mean, if you think about something like Saturday Night Live or, you know, I listen on NPR to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. I mean, they're yeah. constantly making fun of what's gone on in the news. Yeah. That for us is reality, you know, whether it really is true or not. But yeah, they're using that as great fodder for scripts for those shows and many more like that, all the comedy shows. Yeah. There's something interesting that happens with satire, which is that as biting as it may be, it does work when it's biting something that is bigger and scarier than it is. So in other words, it doesn't pick on an underdog, right? Satire targets power, true power. It can't just target a leader. A leader may not have the true power or may not be abusing the power, so the joke might fall flat. But it attacks as its target power and threat and danger and wickedness or cruelty so that the stuff that it's aimed at is always bigger than it is. So it's a David and Goliath dynamic. Mm. You see that in cartoons. Sure. Um, it's interesting. I was just listening to something on NPR the other day that talked about the fact that being a cartoonist now is almost, especially for papers, newspapers, that's a dying art. There used to be thousands of them, and now there are a mere few hundred that are still working as cartoonists for newspapers. Wow, yeah. Yes, yeah. you always see that, the underdog and the bully is <laughs> larger than life. But, you know, when you look at Mel Brooks and you look at what he did with the producers and Springtime for Hitler and all of that, he stared that terrifying monster in the face and laughed at it. And that diminished its power. And it's very tricky to do because you have to be doing it in a way that respects the victim. You know, if you're making fun of Hitler and you're Jewish, that gives you a certain amount of ownership over the pain that you're exposing, which is important, I think, also. But that's part of it. You're diminishing that giant. You're knocking that giant down a peg. And you also understand that you're never going to completely destroy it. And we all love those sort of David and Goliath stories, too. So yeah, yeah. the underdog making it big. <laughs> and right. so often people sort of support the underdog because they want that success. So there's sort of something in our nature that we want that underdog to be successful. Yeah. And you same, see it in sports, too. Yeah. Don't you? I mean, at the same time, we also sometimes want to be the bully. We want to be the dominating force. And so that's why sometimes people do end up ganging up on the underdog. It's a strange phenomenon, obviously. We take the person in the first position down a couple notches. Then once they are missing one leg, then we jump on them. Now they become the underdog and we're attacking them. And then some force of good has to rise up bigger than us and pull us off. It's a strange cycle. It's a very complex, brutal cycle that we've found for ourselves. Yeah, and it's sort of part of somehow the human nature that yeah. um, not quite sure over the years, over the generations that <laughs> this has evolved. Hirsch, this is incredible. And I know we could go on for a long time. This is going down, you know, lots of different paths. How can our listeners find out more about you? Take it away. Let us know. They can find me at uh, hirschrepoon.com, H-E-R-S-H-R-E-P-H-U-N.com. And they can find the book, Selling the Truth, at sellingthetruthbook.com. And that pretty much covers it. I mean, truthtastesfunny.com has the that podcast and Yes Brand method has everything to do with uh, Yes Brand and that podcast. So that's where I can be found. Excellent. And we always love our guests to leave our listeners with a golden nugget. You've given us so many, but uh, what would you like to leave our listeners with? Okay. Well, we talked a lot about conflict and diffusing conflict and getting along in our respective realities. 
And I think that I thought of something the other day, someone had called somebody else a name in the heat of an argument. And the question was, who won the argument? And I said to them, nobody ever won an argument by saying you're an asshole too. (laughs) So that, you know, the winning of an argument uh, doesn't end in a reductive statement. I always believe that winning has something to do with rising above a situation, not trying to, you know, outdo the wickedness. Yeah. And that whole idea of win-win too, wants to be in that win-win situation rather than I win, you lose. So, yes. That was another quote that I have in the book, which is that I am a win-win proponent. I believe that in order for me to win, somebody else has to win also. And again, different perspectives. So, Perfect. I think we've covered a lot of this subject and I can't wait to read the book because I think it's going to be very revealing. Hirsch, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. And listeners, if your book isn't selling the way you wanted or expected to, let's you and I jump on a quick call together to brainstorm ways to ramp up those sales because you've invested a whole lot of time, money, and energy, and it's time you got the return you were hoping for. So go to brainstormwithsusan.com to schedule your free call. And in the meantime, I hope this powerful interview sparks some ideas you can use to sell more books. Until next week, here's wishing you much book and author marketing success.